and remove this non-aqueous phase and produce it and put it back to pristine conditions. Well, one thing we know we're going to do right away, since we simulated this before for the homogeneous case, is we're going to get little blobs of non-aqueous phase everywhere throughout the system. So we're not going to be able to fully clean it up. But we should be able to get most of it out, and we can calculate for this system that we should end up with about 14% residual non-aqueous phase saturation. And we end up with that instead. We get very efficient recovery, relatively speaking, from the fine material, but we get essentially no movement with our pump and treat system from the coarse material. That is, the gravels hold more oil than the sand does. Okay, it's sort of the reverse of what most people think. But it's, again, very easily explained by capillary forces. The non-aqueous phase is a non-wetting phase in this situation, and it has a preference for the larger pore spaces. And the viscous forces, due to flowing here, are simply not strong enough to push it out. Now, this residual oil saturation is a number we stick into computer simulation codes to predict how well a cleanup operation might work in some cases. Actually, it's a number we would like to be able to predict instead of just assume. And so that's a difficult issue to, to play with. Now, this can be easily explained uh, by running a simple experiment in which you take some glass beads of two different sizes and put them in a column. And if you pack them randomly and then do this experiment of water saturation, displace it with the non-aqueous phase, and then drain that or displace that with water, so you do water, oil, water, and see how much non-aqueous phase is left behind, you get about 14% in, in a bead pack. This experiment was done by Norm Wardlaw at the University of Calgary. And um, uh, similar experiments have been done in New Mexico Tech by uh, uh, Norm Morrill. Um, if instead of uh, packing them randomly, you cluster them. That is, you take a little piece of paper and you roll it up. And you fill that inside of that little piece of paper in the column with coarser beads that you've, and surround it on the outside with the finer beads and you repeat this experiment, you find about 40% is left behind. Over here on the, on the right, we've done the same kind of experiment in one of our little sand columns, except we've used two sizes of sand. And basically, we just separated the, the si sand we were dealing with into two size classifications that are subtly different. Here is where we packed one of those little rings of coarser material. There's another little ring of coarser material. And in here was the finer material. And if you take a close-up look of that boundary, you see this kind of thing. This is the coarse area. This is the fine area. If you did a photomicrograph of this and tried to look at the difference in grain size distribution, you'd find it's not very large. It's very subtle. And this is the area that's bypassed. Now, think about this. You're trying to clean up the aquifer by solubilization. It's this giant monster you now have to solubilize. It's not a little blob. It's a large area. And the solubilization is going to occur on the external boundary of that, let's say, plus whatever flow may occur through the interior. It's going to be much more difficult to do, and it's going to have much more of a rate limitation and lead to much more of the kind of thing we see in pump and treat systems, where when you turn the well off, the concentrations come back up. Okay. Um, the story doesn't end right there, though. It gets more complex. Suppose we repeat this experiment, and we push water through at higher velocities. We put a bigger pump in the well, and we apply more energy, and we push through we can actually begin to overcome the capillary resistance in some of these coarser lenses. And we can displace some of the water in them. But what happens as the water is moving through the coarse lens, it's moving faster through the matrix around it. It still gets around to the other side, bypasses it, and traps it off. The only problem is it just does it uh, on the downstream end of these coarse lenses. And now what we have is a residual non-wetting phase saturation that depends on the history of how it was created. The same thing can apply at the pore level, by the way. It just turns out that the energies, forces necessary to do that in groundwater aquifers simply don't occur very often. Uh, but they certainly can occur when you begin to take into account heterogeneities. This is referred to as the residual non-wetting phase saturation. It's a number we stick in our, our, our multi-phase flow codes. We assume we know what's going on with it. We assume we know that number. And in fact, we've just seen in this simple micromodel experiment by doing two different historical scenarios, we get two totally different residual non-wetting phase saturations. In fact, it's something we need to predict, not to assume. And so this is an area of intense uh, uh, speculation right at the moment. And I hope to see uh, uh, various groups uh, do some more research on it. There has been very little uh, work on, uh, in hydrology on the effects of heterogeneity during multi-phase flow.
and relatively little in petroleum engineering that looks at the forces at, at, at action here. In fact, uh, the first place we presented these results were in, in petroleum engineering reservoir conferences. What if you change the situation a little? Let's take the same heterogeneous aquifer and go up a little bit and look at how the d got there in the first place. We're now in the saturated zone. The d is entering from the top. We're looking at the same kind of heterogeneity. And what you see is it plays a large role in that system. And all we've done is by turning the flow field 90 degrees, change the picture entirely. One of the things that occurs when you start looking at heterogeneities is that uh, those of you familiar with issues like poor pressure saturation curves, these properties don't depend just on the pressure or the saturation. They depend on the direction and rate from which water is flowing. It makes the system really nonlinear. In this case, you see what happens is a non-aqueous phase comes in, it encounters a coarse lens, it more or less stops while it fills it up. When it fills it up, it has to then move on. But how does it move on? It doesn't move on through the fine matrix. It likes the coarse lens. It fingers out of it. And so you get this big series of gravity fingers down through the system. And this is one of the reasons it's very hard to find denapples in the field. Imagine putting in an observation core, or just doing a coring right in here, OK? And suppose you got very good recovery from the fine material and very poor recovery from the coarse material. It might be gravel or something like that. What would happen? Well, you get great recovery from the, the fine material where there is no denapple and poor recovery from the coarse material where there the, the stuff exists. And you might very well conclude that there's no denapple present at this location. Even if you did get good recovery from this coarse material, the denapple might drain out before it gets back to the surface using more, most standard procedures. So in this kind of scenario, you could easily end up misinterpreting what's going on. Let's move up to the Vado zone. If I can get the slides coordinated here. Hmm. I apologize. I can't figure out. Uh, sometimes these things interfere with each other. OK. Up in the Vado zone, we're going to look at the same two issues. Uh, Non-aqueous phase spills both a dense and a light. And they shouldn't make any difference up here, right? They're both lighter than. Uh, uh, heavier than air, and uh, you know that's all that should matter. We start out with a system that's full of uh, air and water. Water is a film everywhere at the ceiling, at the floor, and in these pendular rings. And then uh, we're going to introduce um, uh, the non-aqueous phase. And when we introduce the non-aqueous phase, in some cases we some see some very strange behavior. Some cases it moves relatively uniform through the Vado zone. In other cases, it does not. Here's a micro model, one of our early slides, where there's a very high uh, concentration of dyes. It makes the experiment sort of artificial. You may also notice in this experiment the initial water saturation is fairly high. And we're watching a denapple move down through the system. The reason I use this slide, however, is it shows up things rather graphically. What we find in a lot of these cases in the Vado zone, with the right wet wetting order, when you bring the non wetting, uh, uh, the intermediate wetting uh, non-aqueous phase in, it likes to finger at a pore scale. It likes to move through the bigger air-filled pore spaces. And this is not just due to gravity forces. You can do the same experiment in the horizontal and see something very similar. Mm. And if you do pore pressure saturation curves for these models, which you can do, you have to include this propensity for fingering in those models to replicate what you observe. Um, so one thing we see is some fingering in some cases, but not all. The other thing is you can be doing this kind of experiment and the, you know, the water is blue and the air is not colored and the oil here, the non-aqueous phase, is red. And suddenly there's this pool of red way down deep in the system with nothing seemingly connected. And if you look carefully at this slide over here, what you'll see is there's a film of the non-aqueous phase uh, moving down through the system somewhere in this vicinity. Uh, and you're getting two phases flowing at the same time within a pore. You're getting air and oil, and sometimes air, water, and oil. Uh, if you stay to see a videotape this afternoon, uh, it'll be uh, obvious that that's what's happening. So we have more than two flowing phases in any one pore. Well, that may not be uh, big news to, to a lot of us, but it's big news to the models, because every model that we use assumes that only one fluid exists in one pore at a time. There's a sort of capillary preference. The smallest pores have water in them. The largest pores have air in them. And the oil, if it exists, is, exists uh, either uh, filling uh, some of those intermediate pores or at most is a little film that doesn't uh, flow. So uh, that uh, is sort of an interesting phenomenon. And it uh, results in a lot, of, a lot more communication in the aquifer than you might, uh, you might think. 
after the oil comes in, you might end up with something like this on the right. You have air trapped as little blobs of air or bubbles, if you wish. There's oil everywhere. There's water as a film everywhere. And let's take a look at what that, uh, that looks like up close. Um, okay. And let's do that after the air has drained uh, the system again. So let's let the oil move on to the bottom of the aquifer and the air become continuous again. Okay. And uh, what we see after that happens is that the non-aqueous phase exists sort of as a film everywhere between the air and the water. Here's a water-filled pendular ring, and there's, a, uh, there's another uh, poor throat with some water in it and oil surrounding both sides of it. Here's an oil-filled pendular ring. So you have a film of oil. It exists all the way around the system, including the floor and the ceiling, although it's quite thin. You have some uh, poor throats that are filled with oil, and up here, the non-aqueous phase occupies a poor body. Okay. Um, if you go over further in the aquifer, that film can get quite a bit smaller, and it eventually disappears. Let's take a closer up look at it. This is one, uh, an air pocket or a poor body that's filled with air, and it's surrounded by a jacket of the non-aqueous phase. Okay. And surrounding that are some poor throats that are filled with water. And what happens here, of course, is that we have, a, we have this jacket or film of oil everywhere, even at the ceiling and the floor. You can sort of get a feeling for it by looking at that slide. Um, now, as you go toward the ceiling, ceiling or floor of the pore, this jacket or film of oil gets very thin. It uh, can get only a few molecules thick. And we'll see an illustration of that in a few minutes. But it's still there. And that's an assumption that's very common in the mathematical models used to examine this thing, that the intermediate wetting phase forms a film. Um, let's take a look at a different view of the system. Let's go to a different part of the pore space and examine what may happen there. Now, I'm going to show you two illustrations, one taken from one of these micromodel studies with the air phase, phase present. And the other, a photomicrograph of a thin section made with the epoxy styrene freezing technique. The blue here represents the non-wetting phase, air. The red, red represents the wetting phase, water. And the white stuff in between represents an intermediate wetting phase. And you can see the contact angle right in here, where the red sort of has this greater affinity for this quartz grain than uh, the non-aqueous phase does. And the non-aqueous phase has a greater affinity of the quartz, for the quartz grain than does the, the air phase. Uh, this is the non-aqueous phase, this little white dimple in here between the air and the water. This is the stuff that is mimicking, or we're trying to mimic in our micromodel over in here. It's a little different in the geometry I particularly happen to uh, have examined. Let's talk about a couple of things. Now, if you have a groundwater contamination site where there's this non-aqueous phase present in the Vado zone, there's one principal way of getting it out today, most of us know, and that's to use vapor extraction, to basically Try and get this stuff to volatilize in the air phase and then suck the air phase on out by applying a vacuum to the system. Um, and if you can get plenty of pore volumes moving through the air phase, you can get more and more of this stuff out in principle. A couple of issues come into play, and one of those is how quickly can this stuff volatilize? Uh, is it all just Henry's law coefficient? Or are there some other things? Imagine, for example, a multi-component non-aqueous phase, just like we had in the saturated zone. If the more volatile components have uh, come on out into the air phase, the less valuable than have to diffuse through this system. Okay. Well, that's not too bad over here. The, the topology of this is not nearly as complex as, as that of some of the blobs we saw in the saturated zone. Okay. But maybe it is. Take a look at this picture. Remember our oil film is quite thin at the floor and the ceiling. This is sort of the, the same thing as the floor or the ceiling up here. We have a very thin water film. You just simply can't, you can't see it going all the way up here contacting the solid and a very thin oil film on top of it contacting the air and the water going all the way up there. Now, ask yourself in terms of mass transfer coefficients, where is the volatilization occurring? Is it only occurring over this part of the interface, or is it occurring over the entire interface, even this thin film? Under normal aquifer conditions where there's not much airflow, I would say it's happening everywhere, and it's more or less in equilibrium. But if you come in and you start pumping using vacuum abstraction, this air phase, and you're really pushing some volumes through it, then what very likely could happen in some cases is that you would volatilize this non-aqueous phase thin film here, and it m would then have to be resupplied from this reservoir of non-aqueous phase there by spreading out. That would be a great efficiency, because in essence, you'd have this giant surface area all in here 
to volatilize this pool of non-aqueous phase. But that assumes that this thing can spread out fast enough, it's called spreading pressure, that it can overwhelm whatever the volatilization is occurring here. But if the volatilization rate is great enough, it may simply turn out that this surface area is, uh, is not very large, that as the stuff spreads out, before it can spread all the way out, it's volatilized off. Okay, and so the surface area may not be what you would imagine it to. You could misinterpret your experimental results by interpreting the entire thing here to be the surface area, when in fact, in your experiment, it might be something much smaller. And this can affect design parameters in a, in a significant way. Not all um, non-aqueous phase is spread at the water-air interface. There is not always a spreading pressure. If you take a little beaker of water and you take an eyedropper of perchloroethylene and you drop it on that water surface, it will beat up. I've had people say, but it's heavier than water. How can it float at the water interface? Well, the capillary forces are strong enough to hold it up, sort of like a, how a, a, an insect can uh, walk on water. And so you get this beating up of, of the fluid. And the chlorinated solvents, which also happen to be dense non-aqueous phases, are one of those things that in the Vado zone beat up, that do not spread. Here's a picture, a very early picture, hard to see for you, and I'll show you some better ones in a minute, of an air-filled pore body. This is a water-filled pore throat, and there is a little film of perchloroethylene. And here are little beads of perchloroethylene toward the ceiling of the pore, between the water, film, and the air. So we're getting these little beads up here um, on that interface. Let's do the same experiment, but use a different fluid. Instead of using perchloroethylene, I'm using a long chain uh, hydrocarbon in here, which simply also happens to be non-spreading. And we see some very similar things. Over here in this picture, what you see is an air-filled pore. This is a, uh, happens to be filled with the uh, non-aqueous phase in here. It's dyed rose-colored or something. That's a water-filled pendular ring or pore throat below. And here's a water-filled pore throat in there. And you can see this dimple of the non-aqueous phase from both sides. There's another water-filled pore throat. Up here on the ceiling of this pore, we have these little drops of the non-aqueous phase. They are not connected. This film is not ubiquitously connected. But you might say, look, it looks connected to me over here. Okay? So maybe that's just an artifact of one little part of the pore space. Let's go to a different part of the model and look at the same thing. Here's this non-aqueous phase. There's a thin film coming all the way down there, sort of filling the pore wedge, if you wish, down in here. And here's some more of these little drops on the interface toward the ceiling. This thin film here, if it's ubiquitous and spreads out all over the place, should be stable. If it's unstable, that is, if it will separate into isolated pockets, I should be able to break it. And as it turns out, it's quite easy to break that. You simply hit it, the micro model with a pencil, and what we saw is this film snap off. And this interface retreat up here, and that one retreat down there. So these non-spreading liquids are, in fact, disconnected pockets within the Vado zone. They violate all the assumptions we use in our mass transfer models for or in our multi-phase flow models for how fluids are interconnected in the pore space. The non-aqueous phase is not a continuous film between the water and the air. It's a bunch of disconnected pockets. And that's got to dramatically affect things like mass transfer coefficients. Again, you can do an experiment where your mass transfer coefficients are affected by this phenomenon. If you then interpret those experiments, assuming there's a film, you might come to some misunderstanding of, of, of the system. Uh, what kinds of things are non-spreading? Carbon tetrachloride, trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, and uh, most of the chlorinated solvents are examples. Let's change our world a little bit. To a non-wetting fluid and a wetting fluid, to two fluid uh, flow experiments, let's add uh, some new feature. These are polystyrene latex particles over here, fluorescing. And what we're going to add is something to represent colloidal material that may be present in an aquifer. Examples of this are clay minerals and iron oxides, bacteria, and uh, various or, uh, organic uh, 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 particles. Uh, these have an important role because in many cases we assume that contaminants may partition onto the solid material in the aquifer. Okay. And if they partition onto the solid material, even though they may be highly toxic, we don't worry about them as much because they're not mobile. But if the solid material onto which they partition, say one of these colloid particles, is in fact mobile, then the contaminant can move very quickly throughout the aquifer. And so you get what people refer to as enhanced uh, transport or uh, 
uh, of, uh, of the contamination on the colloid particle. And we've been looking at that with these little micromodels that are roughly the size of my thumb with pores as little as 10 microns in, in diameter. And we've been looking at it in combination with this issue of more than one fluid phase present. Okay. Let's start out by building one of these little micromodels and going through the scenario of flooding it with water and then draining it with air and then flooding it with water, trapping little blobs or bubbles of air in it, just like we did with a non-aqueous phase uh, liquid. Okay. And now that model is not too interesting all in itself, and let's pass water uh, through it that has a suspension of particles in it. And the particles I'm going to show you are polystyrene latex particles that are negatively charged and about one micron in diameter. The surface of the glass is negatively charged, and so there's an electrostatic repulsion between the particles and the glass, and we would not expect to see much absorption of the particles on the glass. The only other surface in here in which the particles may interact with are these gas bubbles, and we don't know a great deal about how they're going to interact. Let's see what happens. When you do the experiment, this is what you see. You see the particles move through the system. There is some absorption on the glass. It's well understood how this absorption occurs. It occurs due to the fact that if some particles, by Brownian motion or otherwise, just get close enough to the surface, they can overcome that electrostatic repulsion and they find a, uh, an attractive force called van der Waals forces that pulls it into the surface. Okay. So we can get a sort of net attractive force acting on a few of the particles and you get some absorption of those. Uh, the large particles out here, however, have been trapped onto the gas bubbles. In fact, the, the, the bubbles, the, the fluid-fluid interface is a very effective, effective scavenger of these particles. Now, this is not just an academic experiment. I'll show you a couple of reasons in a minute. But for one reason, I know, is the Vado zone is full of air-water interfaces. The same thing we see here. A uh, couple of, uh, of issues. There's an attractive uh, force for these particles to the interface, and we can speculate on what those may be. One very likely possibility, and certainly is true for a variety of particles, but not necessarily for all, is that these particles, even though they may be relatively hydrophilic, have a positive contact angle. That is, if you made a, a slide of the same polystyrene material, put a drop of water on it, it wouldn't spread on the slide. It would beat up, maybe not with much of a contact angle, depends on the charge density, but it may be three or four or five or six degrees. Uh, in this case, I think it's about eight degrees. And well, I would call that water wet material. That's about the same as quartz. Uh, but what happens is that's enough contact angle, that's enough hydrophobicity, if you wish, that when a particle actually gets to this interface, capillary forces hold on to it. So if you try to pull it back off, the water is just grabbing onto the particle and making it difficult to lift. So once these particles get on the interface, they're very difficult to pull off. The other thing you see is they're flocculating together or clustering. And the reason for that is quite simple. If two particles get near each other, there's a capillary well around each one. And as they get closer, those capillary wells are attractive and they pull toward each other until the particles flocculate. And so you see this clustering. If you look at the videotape, which I'll show this afternoon, uh, you'll see that these clusters are in fact spinning. And in some cases, they're actually moving on the interface, something like this, during flow. And that's the kind of movement I indicated to you that before might, might tell us there may be some advective currents on the inside of these blobs. Okay, so there's quite, a, quite some interesting things going on in the physics. If we repeat this experiment and run it at a much higher ionic strength solution, we can um, get rid of the repulsive force. We end up with a net attractive force. Uh, in the system. Uh, we uh, uh, find uh, particles adsorbed onto the surface, also well explained by uh, uh, classical theories, particles well absorbed onto the glass surface. You still get particles on the, on the, uh, uh, the air bubble. And uh, this is uh, something that's modeled by uh, the, the DLVO theory, for example, that's being applied to groundwater hydrology now. Okay. Um, let me back off of that one first. One time. If you do the experiment uh, at a, um, uh, repeat that experiment uh, and then uh, uh, absorb lots of particles on the surface and then lower the ionic strength again, you can kick some of the particles back off, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, you leave a lot on the surface, even though the, uh, any further adsorption would be quite limited. 
And the funny thing is when you kick them off the solid surface, they end up being attracted to the air-water interface and you end up trapping them on the air-water interface. Now this is not just an academic point. Uh, here's a quick example. If we drain this model with air, flush it with water again, drain it with air, go through a couple of cycles. As the interfaces move throughout the pore space, they scavenge particles off the surface and load them up on the fluid-fluid interfaces. This is a little gas bubble here, just covered with particles. Its interfacial tension has been changed. It's almost filtered out and trapped, uh, as, as you might describe in filter theory in this pore right here. Um, not so much from capillary tension. Uh, you, there's, been a, there's been a tremendous change in the structure of where these particles are in the system. And that has uh, these implications in the Vado zone. It has dramatic effects on denapples, as we'll see in a minute. Before I show you the denapple thing, keep this in mind. Moving interfaces collects particles. Okay. What I'd like to uh, be back off for a minute and show you here, if I could get the slide projectors to cooperate. <laughs> Why not knocking on each other? Is we get the same kind of behavior with clay minerals as we get with polystyrene latex. This is not a function of the fact the particles we're dealing with are artificial and made of, 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 of styrene. If we do the experiment with montmorillonite, kaolinite, uh, iron oxide, titanium oxide, we get qualitatively the same kind of results. Quantitative differences that we can uh, understand theoretically in most cases, but not all. This is an air bubble in a poor body, and this is montmorillonite attached to that air bubble. And in fact, if you look at the videotape of this, Remember I mentioned the polystyrene latex rotating on some of these uh, gas bubbles? These Montmorillonite fern dendrites are actually migrating around this gas bubble like that. Okay. So we see these things happen in the, uh, with other minerals besides uh, the latex. What does that mean? Well, when we did some experiments looking at capillary trap non-aqueous phase, basically denapple blobs, if you wish, what we found is in some materials, the blobs were enormous. And these were homogeneous materials, not heterogeneities. So we weren't getting singlets nearly so much as we were getting very large, complex ganglia. In fact, if you look at these, you'll see they're snapped off and broken. So they're really actually much bigger than that. And if we calculated the residual non-aqueous phase saturation left behind, the denapple saturation left behind, it was about twice as much for this sand that these blobs came from as it was for other homogeneous materials. When we looked at a grain size distribution of it, they were essentially similar. The only difference was these materials had a clay coating on the solid grains. Okay. If we dispersed the clay coating off, we went back to simple blobs and much lower residual saturations. So we left the clay coatings on and we then did some studies. And what we found is that as the interfaces would move through those systems, the Oil water, non-aqueous phase liquid water interface would strip the clay coatings off onto the boundary between the non-aqueous phase liquid and the water, onto this interface. And as that interface would move through the system, say into a water-filled pore throat, collapsing a water pendular ring, you'd be snow plowing these clay particles along the interface together into a pore throat. Now, pore throats are critical because they're the narrow parts of the system. If you clog them up, you change the pore structure. And so as these interfaces would come in, squeezing the water pendular ring with these clay-coated interfaces and then smash the clay together, and later on withdraw when the saturation is redistributed, you ended up bridging that poor throat and blocking it off with clay minerals. And in fact, it's that movement of clays and their attraction to interfaces that results in this porous medium in a dramatically altered pore structure and a dramatically altered residual oil saturation. 1% clay not 10%. So this attraction to interfaces can have dramatic in influence on the system. Um, there are other uh, attributes of these. This is, this is a videotape uh, taken from a videotape of kaolinite in an uh, air-filled pore throat. And over here is a, a pore wedge. And this, these are kaolinite particles. If you look at this film, what you'll see is in the water phase, they're moving very fast in this direction. And on the interface, they're moving equally fast in the other direction. And even from hydrodynamics, it's difficult to explain that particular behavior. And so quite clearly, there are electrical forces being generated in these flowing cases. These are all charged particles. And there's some electrically driven currents of particles at a pore scale. I'm not sure what significance this is, but they're beautiful to watch on a videotape. Bacteria are a different story. We're